Yahuwah ho, Yahuwah ho. Hey, Yahu, Yahuwah ho. Hey, Yahu, Yahuwah ho, Yahuwah ho. Yahuwah ho, hey, yahu, yahuwah ho, hey, yahu, yahuwah ho, yahuwah ho, yahuwah ho. That's the eagle song. We use that song in our Hoke Reela ceremony. That's a personal song that was given to me. So I would use that to get myself centered for a particular ceremony. I could use it uh, to call in the eagle spirit. I could use it as a healing song. I mean, it's, it's my personal song. I can choose to use it the way I want, but the way it was given to me was pretty much to take care of myself and to empower myself and to to align myself with Eagle Spirit when I want to call that in. So healing for Native Americans um, is, is a little bit different, is quite a bit different than, than healing for um, non-Natives Americans. Um, traditionally, we always saw illness as, it's a physical problem, but it's a physical complication due to emotional or spiritual issues. In other words, we have a saying that a person doesn't get ill until their heart's on the ground. Um, and so, so the idea is, is that your body is perfect, it's whole, it's healthy, Creator made it that way, it's fine just the way it is, but if something upsets you, something um, you know, upsets you mentally or emotionally, that physical problems will ensue from that. And so when we look at physical, com or physical complaints, when we look at pathologies, illnesses, diseases, things like that, there's always in traditional native healing practices, there's always a spiritual component that needs to be addressed too. So you can, you know, take whatever medicine you want, but until you address the spiritual component, you're never gonna be completely healed. And I have a for instance on that. A number of years ago, and, and I mean like 30 or 40 years ago, one of the insurance companies got really smart. The Diné, the Navajo, suffer from gallstones. It's their diet. It's, it's a horrible diet. And so Native Americans, the Diné, the Navajo, get gallstones on a regular basis. And the insurance company, who of course was paying for their trips to the hospital and stuff, found that if they paid for what the Navajo call a sing, because they sing their way through their healing ceremonies. There's everything that's recited is, is a song, okay? So what they found is that if they would pay for the sing that goes along with um, the surgery for the gallbladder, if they did the spiritual support that went for the illness of the gallstones, the Navajo didn't get gallstones again. So what they found is that if the Diné got gallstones and they went to the hospital and just had the surgery, the gallstones came back. But if the Navajo went in and had the gallstones removed and they had the sing, the gallstones never came back. What we didn't find out was is if a Navajo had gallstones and they just did the sing, did the gallstones go away and they didn't have to have the surgery? But of course, the insurance company didn't keep information on that. But that'll give you an idea of how natives see illness. It's not just a physical thing, it's an emotional, psychological, spiritual thing that allows the illness in. Well, a long time ago, prior to contact, in the East, we used to have what was called peace villages. And these peace villages were actually like universities. It was a combination of sanctuary and local university. And there would be peace villages spread out through all the eastern seaboard, actually all of the eastern uh, woodland states, areas, regions would have these. And the peace villages are where people went when they were really ill and they needed healing because that's where all the wise people were. But also it worked in the fact that if 
a native person committed a crime within their tribe, crimes and things that are done out of meanness is considered an illness. It's considered a psychological and a spiritual illness. So when someone perpetuated a crime, they weren't thrown in jail like they, were, like they are nowadays in, in modern times. What they were is they were treated like they were sick. And so they were looked after by a number of, of relatives. They were given special diets. They were uh, taken into particular ceremonies to heal them. They were asked to do meditative walks or particular work within the community to heal their souls and their spirits so they wouldn't perpetuate these crimes. If somebody really did have like a psychological problem and kept doing it and kept doing it, wasn't getting any better, instead of being thrown in jail, they would be shunned from the tribe. And so they had to live in the wild by themselves. And not having people, not having family is one of the worst things that can happen to a Native American is to not have his, his or her people. So criminals that could not be, you know, rehabilitated were shunned from the tribe and forced to live into the, in the woods. And so one of the things that these peace villages did was if someone who had been shunned and thrown out of the tribe and was living in the wild decided that they wanted to be rehabilitated, they would go, they would seek help at these peace villages and that's where they would live for the rest of their lives being rehabilitated and being taken care of. And again, their crime is seen as an illness, which is why they went to these peace villages where they could be healed. Healing ceremonies from tribe to tribe are going to be different because the tribe's traditions are going to be different and where the tri tribe lives geographically is going to be different from another tribe. And native traditions and culture totally spring up from the ground, from the, the region in which we live. For instance, people in the woodland were extremely agrarian. Um, and there's lots of rivers and there's lots of creeks and the weather pattern on in the eastern forests are very different from the prairies in the southwest. So even though they're very agrarian, there are no um, rain dances, no, uh, no rain dances in the east. There's songs to bring the rain and songs to send the rain and the clouds and the thunder and stuff like that. But we don't have regular rain dances. The areas where you find rain dances are in the southwest where they really have to work, actively work, to get the rain to come in. So that's what you'll see down there. So ceremonies for native people um, really reflect where they live. And of course, as I mentioned before, every illness has, is, is seen as having a spiritual component to it. So you want ceremonies to heal the spirit along with healing the bodies. And the ceremonies, are, are, they're just so diverse depending on where, uh, what part of Turtle Island, which is the North American continent, that you live on. So Turtle Island is what Native people call the North American continent itself from the Arctic Circle down to like the Panama Canal where the isthmus is and it gets very narrow. The whole thing is considered Turtle Island. And I'm trying to think if I've ever heard a native story that didn't say that the North American continent rode on something other than the back of a turtle and I can't. Mm -hmm. There's stories from the tribes, especially in the East I can think of, but I'm also thinking of some of them in the West. Um, the ones out of the Southwest, they pretty much don't say what the continent's writing on, but if there's a story that mentions it, it's always that spider or grandmother or somebody got mud from the bottom of, of the great water and spread it out on the back of the turtle. And once the mud started being spread out on the back of the turtle and it started drying, it got bigger and so on. And so the entire continent rides on the back of a turtle now. There is a ceremony up north in Canada called Shaking Tent, in which a person gets into um, a very, very small dome-like structure like a sweat lodge would be, but it's only big enough for one person to be in. And Sweat lodges, the, um, the saplings are put down into the ground anywhere from, you know, a couple of inches to, you know, six, eight inches. The saplings go into the ground. And with shaking tent, they're done the same way so that when the structure is built, it's really solid. But during the ceremony, 
the whole structure sways and bends and so on. It's very unusual. Um, you could use your weepy or a nipi for healing ceremonies. There are specific healing ceremonies, which is what I was raised with in my family. Um, there are particular prayers and ceremonies that go for bleeding, particular uh, prayers and ceremonies that go for healing burns, um, babies that don't grow, other illnesses and so on. There's a particular prayer and a particular ceremony that goes for um, the different pathologies so they can be healed. So ceremonies are a really big part of, of healing in the Native community. Herbs, of course, are considered gifts from the Creator to heal ourselves. We believe that there's 100% balance on the earth. So if there is a malady that comes up, for whatever illness is there, Creator has also given us an herb to heal, to heal that. So really the, the herbs would be used for the physical healing, like say you cut yourself or you burnt yourself or you have a broken bone or you know you got mauled by a bear or whatever, you wouldn't just go into ceremony, you really would apply the herbs to the, the cuts and the, the you know bites and the abrasions and so on. You, you want to address the situation physically, but it's not the whole picture is where herbs come in. We would use herbs traditionally just the same way we would use herbs now. There are chemical elements within the herbs that have balancing effects on the body and healing effects on the body, and so we would use them that way. But it's only part of the picture of healing. You know, before contact with the European, uh, all the plants that were available for us were, were indigenous plants here on Turtle Island. And with the coming of the Europeans, um, lots of different seeds came in in the coats of animals or it came in with the grain seeds and so on. And those plants have spread all over this particular continent. So we have a lot of plants now that are not indigenous to this continent but, but are alien. But the interesting thing is the tribes, the healers in the tribes, when these new plants would spring up, they would go, wow, I've never seen this plant before. But they would do the same things they always did is they would watch the animals to see if the animals ate it or not or how the animals used that particular plant so that they would know how to use that particular plant. Um, or they would pray and ask for a vision and understand how to use it. But anything that was available was utilized in, in the environment. Everything was used. So whether it was an indigenous plant or an alien one, it was definitely used. And of course, there's still indigenous plants that are available now that, that we all use. But um, I'll be honest with you, whatever's available, if it works, regardless of where it came from originally, if it's there, we use it, you know. And of course, gathering too um, was very specific, the way that we gathered. Some plants were only picked at a particular uh, time of the month, depending on the phase of the moon, or it was if there were roots or whatever, they were harvest in the fall, if it was bark or whatever, it was the fruits of plants or the leaves or the blossoms. I mean, all these things have different times of the year or the month or whatever or the phase of the moon to be picked by. But more than anything, across the board with all the tribes is you never take without giving. So when we would go to pick plants, we would always take um, tobacco or cornmeal or sometimes corn pollen. And we would make a prayer and thank the grandparent in whatever stand of plants we're looking at. If you see a stand of plants, you never pick from that stand. You go to, to you see another stand of plants and you pick there. You always want to leave the first stand of plants alone because that will ensure the next generation to come. Okay, so you always have something you don't touch, something you don't disturb that would ensure the next generation of that particular botanical. Um, and then when we find plants that we want to pick, we find the oldest plant, we make an offering to that plant, thank them for having such a large family that we can choose from, and then we pick the, the younger members from that, that community there. But we never take the oldest plant and we never take all of the plant because you want to make sure it's, it's there the next time you need it. Bear medicine, I've always been taught that bear medicine is essential for any traditional native healer. Bears are our closest relative on this continent. So when a bear stands up, all of his organs are in the same place that 
a man's organs or a woman's organs would be if when they are standing on their hind legs. So we look just like a bear in regards to our, our insides. And since we don't have primates like monkeys or apes on this continent, bears are our closest relative. And it's believed that native healers, if you want to be good at what you do, you need to either have bear medicine or, or develop bear medicine because bear has been the one that has taught the people how to use the different herbs. We've always watched the animals, like I mentioned before, to see where they go and what they eat and determine if that plant is going to be viable for human beings. There's a number of stories that a lot of the different tribes have about watching bear pick the first medicine and that's how the first healers learned to pick and use medicine was watching the bear after bear came out of winter hibernation and needed certain nutrition to, to you know get healthy again and get back out there in the bear community so they watched what bear ate and if bear came out of the den and was sickly or whatever and needed to put on weight there were other plants that bears ate and so they watched these things and so we've learned a lot about herbal medicines from bear but from other animals too and while we use the chemistry within the plants to do whatever they're supposed to do. Let's say yarrow is a hemostatic, so we use yarrow to stop bleeding. Those chemical compounds are, are in the plant and we use that chemistry, but there's also a spiritual component to the plant too. And that's where you can say, oh, this particular plant has um, bird medicine, or this plant has got swan medicine, or this plant has got hawk medicine or rabbit medicine. Um, there's actually a plant called rabbit tobacco because that's what the, the rabbits eat, you know, like they would be smoking their pipes or whatever, they'd be eating these to, this tobacco or this particular plant. Um, and of course, there's a lot of different plants that are named after different animals. Deer's tongue is one of the things my grandfather taught me to put in my tobacco blend because it made it nice and sweet, but you only use a little bit of it. Um, so. So some plants bear animal names, but they bear the animal names either because something physical about the plant or something spiritual about the plant. And so plants have two levels of characteristics and properties. One is physical and the other one is spiritual. One of my favorite in known indigenous herbs is chaparral. Uh, probably because it's so strong and it's a really good anti-cancer agent. It's really good for healing um, skin eruptions and infections and so on. Um, and that's an indigenous, that's an indigenous herb. Uh, chaparral is a creosote bush and it's what you smell on the high prairies after a rain. It's a very distinct smell. You know it when you smell it. And the people that I know that live in the Southwest say that that's one of their favorite things after a rain is to go outside and they can smell the chaparral, that it's wet and it's up and in the air and it's really wonderful. Um, so that's, that's a, a native herb that I can think of that I, I really do use a lot of because it's a very strong, potent, powerful herb. I use it in like, especially my ointments and so on. I use it as an antimicrobial um, agent but especially topically, it's just fabulous. Really helps um, cuts and scrapes and abrasions, whatever you've got heals really fast. Um, the way I continue that aspect of my traditional healing in with my modern herbal practice is, um, I was raised in a family where we had uh, a spiritual healer in the family and I was raised with the little ceremonies and the prayers. When I was a little kid, if we got a cut or a scratch or whatever, we had somebody in the family who would stop, pray over you, do whatever little ritual it needed to be, whatever ceremony it was, and take care of it. And everybody in my family was healed that way. Um, along with that, you know, I learned some herbal healing from my great-great-grandmother uh, and my aunts and stuff uh, along that line. So I grew up with all these ceremonies, and f so my option as an, a modern Native American herbalist is I can do the chemistry in plants just like a good pharmacist would, and I can use that chemistry to apply to a situation and help heal the body that way. Or if I find that in my working with a client that you know, they, they might really have a physical ailment, but the cause of the ailment isn't a physical 
problem, it's a spiritual or emotional problem, I might recommend to that person, if I think that they're a good candidate for it, to take them into ceremony and address their illness that way. So I can, I can use the plants like a chemist would. I can use the plants and use them in a spiritual way, or I cannot even use the plants at all and just go into ceremony and try and, and do the healing that way. One of the things that I do with my company, my formula company, is I work by the phases of the moon, which is the way I was taught, is that you put your tincture together on the new moon and you pull it off, you pour it off on the full moon. So as the moon is getting, is waxing and it's getting stronger, your tincture is getting stronger with it. And so instead of relying on a Julian calendar, where you've got all these little squares and all these little dates, we would just watch the moon. And so if, if the moon was growing and getting full, that's when we would put our tinctures together. So we would work by the faces of the moon. I smudge my lab and my office regularly. I smudge it to clean it out of any bad um, energy. And then I pray over everything. So I do that too. And I, I think that's got a profound effect um, over over what I do and, and with the formulas that I make, I, I think praying over anything makes it stronger. And that's the way I was taught, so I, I definitely do that. So, and when we're working in the lab, you know, I try and have good music, you never have a bad thought, that type of thing. If you're fighting with somebody, stop fighting with them and then go to work, you know, get that energy cleared out of your head and out of your heart before you address anything because. You know, the people are sick, they, they need assistance, and so what you give them, you want to give them everything that you can that is strong and healthy. You don't want to give them anything that's tainted. And so that's why the smudging, that's why the prayers, that's why the mindfulness when you're in the lab making the different formulas. Traditionally, all the healing, the ceremonies, the songs, the herbs, everything, none of it was written down. All of it's oral, and I mean, certainly what, what I was taught, the healing ceremonies and the herbs that I was taught and the things that I was taught to make, was, was nothing was written down. It was always, come here and learn this, you know, or sit with me and learn that. And so that's how I learned in my family. And when I started traveling, I really had, it was wonderful because I had the opportunity when I was a lot younger to visit some, uh, some of the elders all over the country and just sit with them. And I found if you could, you could sit all night, as long as you kept feeding them coffee and cigarettes, they'd talk all night long <laughs> and learn all sorts of things. Of course, coffee and cigarettes isn't really what you, we should be giving our elders to keep them or with us for a long time, but that's what they wanted. But if you would sit with an elder, and they would sit up all night and just talk. You learn all sorts of things. It's great. But it's all oral. You know, and so that's why I think we've lost a lot, and it's that's unfortunate. Lost out of that tradition. Well, I, my generation, which is college trained, I mean, there are some things that we still don't write down, but there's a lot of things we have learned to document because we've lost so much, and we're not willing to lose anymore. And even though it's not the way we used to do it, if we don't want to lose anymore, we do it that way now. Yahoo, 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 Yaho